Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss. In The Mandalorian Chapter 3, The Sin continues this hot streak of solid, straightforward, Western-inspired Star Wars storytelling that has us looking over our shoulder thinking, yeah, this is actually good, right? I'm enjoying a Star Wars thing without complaint? Cool, 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 just making sure. Of the three episodes so far, this one might contain some of the deepest cut Star Wars Easter eggs yet. And in addition to that, some really clever visual details that show how much craft is being put into these episodes. So let's break it all down, spoilers ahead. This episode opens with the adorable moment on Mando's ship, with Baby Yoda unscrewing a knob off a lever because babies want toys. I know, I know, I really should be calling him something like Yoda-ling, because Baby Yoda implies he's Yoda's baby, or Yoda's clone, something that's not confirmed yet. But uh, Yoda-ling, both the word itself and the sound, it pits in my head, it sounds stupid. So deal with it until he's named, he's Baby Yoda. Cool? They return to the residence of the client, greeted once again by the gatekeeper droid. We saw one of these at Jabba's palace in Return of the Jedi. This episode often places the camera inside the baby's pod with him. In my breakdown of chapter two, I pointed out the parallel between Baby Yoda encased in the pod and Mando encased in his helmet. These protective shells that limit their views of the outside world. Mando hands off Baby Yoda to the client in Dr. Pershing, and Pershing's red scammer light reflects on Mando's helmet, as if he too is undergoing a kind of identity verification in this moment. What kind of man is he? Is the bounty worth giving up this innocent child? The container that the client stores the Beskar inside is an awesome Easter egg. This prop is from The Empire Strikes Back. It's carried by a random Cloud City resident named Wilro Hood as people fled the city. The prop is made from an ice cream maker. So fans over the years have loved this and called him Ice Cream Guy. And during production of The Mandalorian, Jon Favreau shared an Instagram post of it. I just love that it ended up playing a pretty big role here. Werner Herzog opened it. The client is insulted when Mando asks what they're gonna do with the kid, pointing out that asking about the fate of the bounty is against guild code. This episode as a whole is very much about codes, ways, customs. Before, it was Quill who would repeat his mantra, I have spoken. Now the Mandalorians repeat, this is the way. Now this episode's title is The Sin, suggests it's a sin to violate such ways and means. But we learn at the end of the episode that there's actually a greater sin that one could carry on one's conscience, the sin of inaction, the sin of letting evil go forward. Mando is challenged by this heavy infantry guy, credited in other places as Paz Vizla, and I'm pretty sure this is voiced by Jon Favreau himself. Make it a little cameo. Our strength was once in our numbers. This Mandalorian is proud, angry over having to live like sand rats in secrecy, making deals with the devil to maintain their way of life. And when they fight, notice how their daggers vibrate. These are vibro blades. Oft mentioned weapons in the Star Wars universe. They have a current that maximizes cutting effectiveness. Mando tells the armorer about the Mudhorn. I guess that was its name, makes sense. That he defeated last episode, but since he was assisted by baby Yoda, he refuses to make it his signet. So we learn that to the Mandalorians, Signets come from a beast that you have to kill or tame. This actually stems from their ancestor, Mandalore I, who first conquered the great Mythosaur of their planet, thus why the leaders of the Mandalorians bear as their signet the skull of the Mythosaur. The armorer forges for him whistling birds, guided bullets similar to Yondu's Yaka Arrow in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, which he does command via whistling. And once again during this forge montage, Mando is triggered back to memories of his family under attack. We see in this memory that the attackers are super battle droids. These were used by the Separatists during the Clone Wars. So here's my question. If the Separatist droid is the one that attacked Mando and his family, leaving him with a lifelong hatred of droids, who do we think rescued him here? Is it a clone trooper? Or someone we might know, like Anakin Skywalker? General Kenobi? Hello there. Or could his rescuer have been the great Yoda? <laughs> explaining his fondness for this young creature. Let me know who you think saved him in the comments below. Before I continue, thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. A VPN allows you to browse the internet with privacy without things like ad companies, hackers, spyware, any of these shady types tracking your data, secretly filtering your internet experience. ExpressVPN masks your IP address to make sure you aren't being monitored so you can have that peace of mind. You can live life knowing empire loyalists like Werner Herzog aren't tracking your movement and sending bounty hunters after you. Personally, I used ExpressVPN recently when I was out of the US, and I wasn't able to stream new episodes of Rick and Morty, but using ExpressVPN, now no one can filter what I want to watch online just based on where I am or what they decide I should have access to. ExpressVPN is the fastest VPN on the market and the number one VPN service rated by Tech Radar. And say you're in a different country, you might not be able to get access to everything on Netflix or YouTube or other streaming services. Thanks to ExpressVPN, you can avoid those weird restrictions and just watch everything you would want to normally, the way the internet should be, wherever you happen to be that moment. ExpressVPN lets you securely stream or download 
download content from anywhere at any time. It's less than $7 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And you can get three extra months free by clicking on the link in the description and visit expressvpn.com slash newrockstars. Moving on, Mando returns to his guild leader, Grief Karga. He has been paid well in Beskar 2, something that gives Mando pause. Because in his eyes, Every piece of Beskar is a stolen natural resource from his home world that belongs to his people. So later, shooting him in that piece of metal seemed like kind of a stinging reminder of that. Mando's next target is a Mon Calamari, whom Grief describes as a nobleman's son. Perhaps that nobleman could be the war hero, Admiral Akbar, though it's a little racist to assume all Mon Calamari are related. It's a trap! Grief says that the bounty hunter is on the ocean dunes of Karnak. Karnak could have gotten its name from the Karnak temple ruins of Egypt. I appreciated Mando's diss of the New Republic. That's a joke. It's a sobering reminder that despite the apparent universe-wide celebration after the Battle of Endor, the efforts to restore democracy from the ashes of the Empire are fledgling at best. And barely a generation later, it's all gonna be replaced by an Empire doppelganger. Back on his ship, Mando finds the knob and he freezes. And you just gotta love a hero moment when the seemingly heartless guy goes still as he works up the nerve to go back and do the right thing. And now notice Mando's helmet reflects a green light, a contrast with the red light from before, Green being the color of Jedi lightsabers, red the color of Sith lightsabers, red meaning stop this, and green now signaling go get them. Or go ahead and stop and go ahead and uh, leave. Green means go, so I know to go ahead and shut up about it. As he marches back into danger, the composer once again sneaks in a leitmotif to John Williams' force theme. Mando spots the discarded pod in the garbage. I pointed out before how that pod was designed to evoke the shape of an egg. And now seeing this empty egg shell in the trash reminds Mando of how his previous clients handled that egg bounty. So, yeah. Greeted again by the gatekeeper droid, Mando rips off its head, just like how Baby Yoda removed the knob from the end of that lever. Inside, Mando finds Pershing with Baby Yoda and a classic ITO Imperial interrogator droid, just like the one Vader used on Leia on the Death Star. Now, it's not clear what procedure he was doing, but his patch does look like the same emblem of the Kamino cloning facility in Attack of the Clones, so perhaps the aim is to attempt to clone this newly discovered member of Yoda's species, rather than this child being the clone of anything itself. Because think about it, the client wouldn't have cared if this kid died because all he needs is his DNA. And maybe that interrogator droid was here to supervise Pershing. Mando escapes with the kid and the other bounty hunters get notified. Kind of like that moment in John Wick 2 when all the other assassins get notified to go after him. Grief drops another classic Star Wars nod. Because I'm your only hope. This is kind of thing is, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mando escapes by taking cover in an astromech droid driven carriage that he passed earlier, forcing him to finally be escorted in a vehicle driven by an astromech droid. No droids. He gets bailed out by the other Mandalorians on jetpacks, including Paz Vizsla, who later soars behind him, gives him a salute, which with this being Favro, has gotta be an Iron Man shout out, right? And coming full circle with the opening scene, Baby Yoda finally gets his ball. And if you listen closely, you can hear he lets out this tiny little giggle. Reminding us of the moment that we first met one of these things back on Dagobah, similarly laughing it up as he played with the stuff that he shouldn't be playing with. <laughs> Comment down below with your thoughts on this episode. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss and subscribe to our WookieLeaks podcast feed for all of our Star Wars analysis. Thanks for joining me. Bye. <laughs>